Hey everybody, it's Scott Steen with winnersandwiners.com coming to you live from the bunker here in, uh, in Coronaville as we continue our coverage of the NFL draft. Uh, total disclosure, we were all set to have uh, uh, JT Gray of the New Orleans Saints and as often happens in this uh, post-corona world, uh, we had a little problem logistically. We didn't have him on today. Uh, promises that we will have him on in the future to talk a little bit about his particular experience on draft day and how all that looks in uh, how about those actually a lot of guys from Mississippi State that were taken that we wanted to talk to him about and as always I'm joined by my partner uh, all the way from Long Island New York across the country uh, sequ sequestered in his own corona bunker it is the one the only he is Scott Reichel Scott how are you today sir uh, doing pretty well at this point in the draft we're about what like 11 hours in and we got roughly five more hours so you know, the draft is always a lot of fun for people who crave sports and who want their teams to do well. And then you remember how long the draft is, and you realize you were pretty much only excited for the first day. And then after that, I mean, if you really dive deep into the draft and you know some sleepers who your team might have picked in the fifth round, other than that, though, most of the time, people have no idea who their team is picking for the last, I'd say, what, four rounds? Give yeah, or take. yeah, I was. I would say. I would say that's. Uh, I would say that's a. Uh, I was. I'd say that is a pretty uh, fair statement. Uh, yeah, a pretty a pretty fair statement indeed. Um, you know, because I was looking at. We were talking about off air the the Chiefs, who were they who they were picking, and they've already they've already got into people that I've never heard of. So uh, they took a, a Louisiana Tech safety in the fourth round so I saw the Jets took uh, James Morgan in their last pick and uh, I know about him for all the wrong reasons because I did not like him at all at Florida International but it is what it is you know it happens teams are gonna just draft some positions leave you scratching your head shout out to the Eagles fans listening it gets brighter remember you won a Super Bowl a couple years ago uh, it's not the end of the world so keep that in mind yeah. now, is, that, is that your official team Scott are you are you a Jets guy I root for the Jets and the Cowboys personally. And I feel like we've gone through this uh, before. I know my, dad, we have. my dad's a huge Cowboys fan, so I grew up rooting for the Cowboys as well. And for some reason, I liked the Jets, which in hindsight might be one of the worst decisions I've ever made. But I was like three. So I'm going to give myself a pass on that. But I should have probably have taken it back if I could. A lot of struggles. A lot of struggles. How do you like uh, how do you like Dallas's draft so far? I think Jerry Jones should do the draft on his personal two hundred fifty million dollar yacht every year from now on. That's that's how I feel about it. I'm pleasantly shocked at how the draft has gone. Now, of course, the Cowboys had to ignore every position of need in the first round, which is a tradition. They never do it. But C.D. Lamb was handed to them on a silver platter. You kind of had to take him. Didn't have a choice. Didn't no, he had no choice. Especially considering the fact that Philadelphia was about to take him roughly, what, four, five picks later? Right. He kind of right. had to take him. So that's my thoughts on that. The Jets also, solid draft. Can't. It's weird. Both of the teams I root for have actually looked pretty good in the draft, and I'm kind of concerned. You know, it would. it, it is kind of a weird year that uh, we don't have the Jets fans booing every pick. Well, oh, well, you had the uh, virtual booze in the background, which I liked the premise, which was that you can donate money for Corona research and get your face on one of the screens in the back, you know, and you can boo the commissioner or whatever. And, you know, booing the commissioners, I guess people say it's a tradition. It's not. It's a tradition because people hate Goodell. So that, that wasn't something that was around when Cosell was commissioner and stuff like that. It's a, uh, it's a tradition because everybody hates Goodell. Yeah, I don't remember. Just like you said, I don't, I don't remember uh, uh, Pete Rosell just being – Yeah, I said Cosell. I meant Rosell. You know, you know what I meant. My bad. Absolutely. Um, I don't remember them uh, just raining down derision upon Pete Rosell back in the – Comes in out to announce the fifth pick. Boo, Rosell. You, no, that wasn't a thing. It was because <laughs> – People actually think Roger Goodell is so bad at his job that booing became a tradition. So I guess the NFL tried to put a positive spin on it, which I guess you kind of have to do because Goodell right. has, made the, has made the owners of teams so much money 
that you can't really get rid of him. And I think a lot of people don't realize that in the, I'd say, casual fan aspect of it where they just think, oh, Goodell's terrible. You know, he had the Patriots fiasco. He doesn't know what he's doing. And then you look at the uh, the money spreads for all of the owners and you realize, ooh, he's made all these owners billions of dollars and Goodell gets paid roughly $28 million a year. So they're probably not going to get rid of him anytime soon. No, I don't, I don't, I don't think they are. Uh, who had the, uh, who's, who's draft pad were you most impressed with? Cliff Kingsbury. Uh, don't get me wrong. I thought Jerry Jones looked very nice. And then I realized it was on a private yacht. Is that the, was that the deal with that big couch and the whole setup that he had? Yeah. He's just chilling on uh, his version of the Titanic and he's just, you know, hanging out, trying to draft while staring directly into a TV screen. But Cliff Kingsbury's house was definitely the nicest house I've seen. And Mike Vrabel definitely has the most, has the most unique entourage if I was going to party with anybody in the NFL, I'd be most concerned about partying with Mike Vrabel. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Certainly about getting up on time the next day. Yep. It's like pretty he's much. got a pretty, pretty good setup there. Uh, of course, he had his, I guess he had his, uh, two of his sons, and then they have a buddy of theirs that lives with them. I guess. One of them was dressed as Joe Exotic. The other one was dressed up as Frozone from The Incredibles. And one of them was in the bathroom. So I don't really know what was going on at Vrabel's house. It looked like a party, I'll tell you that much. Oh, uh, good times. Good times. Good times. You, think, you think this will be a one and done? Scott, do you think they'll all be back in uh, – where, where are they going next year? Oh, you didn't hear? They're going to the lovely area of Cleveland next year. Oh, Cleveland next year? And they're going back to Vegas in 2022. You know, you know that was – he certainly blew that announcement when he said – I. Uh, we just want to know the Raiders are hosting the 2020 draft again yeah. next year. <laughs> exactly. Unreal stuff. That like, that's, that's good content right there. Like, yes, we, we know they're hosting the 2020 draft. <laughs> oh man. So Scott, we are going to, we're going to do a, I think probably we can take a look at the complete draft on Monday, the winners and losers and all that. And to be honest, all our fans out there, if you like Scott and I's personality and you, and you think we have good chemistry between the two of us, you're probably going to enjoy this show. If you look uh, for hard-hitting information and, uh, and drilling down, eh, this is probably going to be the show for you because we're, kind of, we're kind of doing this one on the fly. So we're, uh, you know, we're, just, we're just kind of winging it. We're just going to have a little but, bit of Yeah, fun. plan B was kind of just to get the camera rolling and just have us roast everything in sight. That was kind of what we had in mind. And, uh, yeah, I'm kind of looking forward to it, to be honest. I, you know, I'm an old man. I hate a lot of things. So... <laughs> I'm the I'm the guy for your I'm the guy uh, for you absolutely. So there. does that bother you that since everyone is stuck indoors, you can't yell at the local kids to get off your lawn? Does that bother you at all or no? Yeah, it really does. Um, you know, and I actually live in an apartment, so yelling at them to get off my lawn has been replaced by yelling at people for driving too fast. You can always yell at the upstairs neighbors, though. You know, they're they're actually they're actually pretty cool. Um, Scott, I mean, the last time? Yeah, but you might have to create some controversy just so you can fulfill, you know, the all the tasks that it requires an old person to do. <laughs> the old man role. Yeah, I'm, yes. I'm, I'm, I'm resisting getting old, man. I don't, I don't, I've seen the future. I don't care for it. Well, it depends so. if we're going to bed at 8.30 or not, but that's a separate story. You know, now that, I've, now, now that my generation has ruined the world for you guys, I think my work here is done. <laughs> so. uh, your ge- yeah, my generation might have potentially ruined the world for everybody. I don't know what's going on with my people. Um, I mean, everywhere you look, you got random people recording themselves doing random dance moves in public. And I'm not sure, A, why you're in public in the first place, and B, why you thought the uh, dairy section of a grocery store was the perfect spot to record a dancing video. I don't know really what's going on with people my age. Scott, do you want to give out your TikTok information so people can... Unfortunately, I don't have it because I have a personality. So that's kind of where that went awry. But I don't know. Don't get me wrong. If you're into that stuff, good for you. Whatever gives you entertainment. I just, everything is so repetitive. And the issue is none of it makes me laugh. And it's a platform designed to make you laugh. So I don't see the point. You're kind of an old man yourself there, even at a young age. Uh, That's kind of a problem. That's probably why I didn't party as much as I probably should have in college, is that I was just... You know, I was the, I don't want to say the reserved guy, but at the end of the day, I wasn't going as hard as everyone else because I just 
felt like I didn't really need to, if that makes sense. It does. It does. So, um, yeah, you were you were there to get your degree and all kinds of stuff like that. And then you, uh, oh, don't get me wrong. I was still partying and whatever, but I kind of I wasn't going out on a random Tuesday. Oh, you going? We got happy hour deals on fish bowls. I'm like, no, I got class tomorrow at nine thirty in the morning. Yeah, yeah. That's the thing about that's the thing about college is you can always you can always find a party, especially you're in a fraternity, right? Uh, yeah. And I was also in Wisconsin, which is a top five drinking school in the country. So. Well, they're, they're one of the big songs they sing is uh, the, is the Budweiser theme up there it was at Camp Randall, right? Uh, you do that, but for the most part, it's mostly just jump around. And uh, you also have uh, Come On Eileen and stuff like that. Oh, uh, see, that was, uh, that was after the time I, I was up there. Because I, I was talking the other day that I had seen a game at Camp Randall. It is, You're uh, only 35. Relax. You're not that old. Calm down. Oh, uh, you know, I do, I do feel like I skew young for my age. Um, I'll, most of my friends are younger and... Uh, I don't. I don't really care for people my age. I, I got to be honest with you. They, they, See, the secret to that is to just never carry your ID, and then you're just whatever age you tell people you are. Well, I don't ever carry my ID, but that's for different reasons. Fair enough. Fair enough. We can talk about that another time, or I can wait for the uh, for the autobiography to come out. God, what happened to fullbacks? How come there's no fullbacks taken yet? Um, I think the issue with that is that people realize fullbacks basically are important in maybe one package or so, and other than that. I mean, nowadays especially, you're pretty much throwing the ball. I'd say about what seventy percent of the time. Yeah, I would. Uh, I would. I would be curious to see. Uh, yeah, I think that's probably right. I bet the high 60s, 70 percent of the Are time. Are you excited for the uh, copycat league copying everything that the Chiefs do for the next five years? Uh, good luck. Yeah, you know, that's, that's all. I'm, that's what teams are going to try to do. So I don't really see running backs being that. I mean, you've already seen them starting to get phased out, with the exception of a couple of teams. And every team that's given the running back a massive contract has not made the playoffs. Oh, it's so, awful. I mean, I feel like from this point on, I was shocked that a running back went in the first round. I know from a betting perspective, you had uh, over half running back as a slight favorite. I would not surprise me to see, besides a Saquon Barkley or some people they think could be an Adrian Peterson type, there should really never be a running back taken in the first round at this stage in the NFL. Totally agree, and I, you know, we talked about it a little bit yesterday with the with the Chiefs. I was I was stunned that of all the teams that they picked a running back in the first round, they, it's it's not something the Chiefs the Chiefs look for a very particular kind of running back, a guy that with good hands who can block, catch the ball out of the backfield. The running aspect of it is really kind of secondary. Um, they don't run a lot of uh, they don't count on the running game a lot, and with Pat Mahomes, he almost. As a Chiefs fan, it's really weird to watch him play because down and distance almost means nothing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, another team, they get a, a holding penalty on second down. All of a sudden, it's second and 20. You're like, well, that we're going to be punting for sure. Well, especially with spot fouls with passing interference. I mean, you can just get a 70-yard penalty every time. Well, that is true. Um, That's also then, a factor. I mean, it separates it from fact. college, at least, where 15 yards is a lot different than 50 yards. What do you like? What do you like better? Uh, I, I like 15 yards. Do you? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of torn because, you know, if you're, if you're throwing a pass from midfield and the guy's wide open at the five and he completely gets mugged, I'm not sure that shouldn't be rewarded at the five. You know, I really – Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a very tricky spot. For me, I prefer 15 just because I feel like spot fouls are a way for the NFL to manufacture more points. And I just don't really find it as genuine as it probably should be. Maybe that's just me, but I feel like every the strategy nowadays is just chuck the ball as far as you can, and the refs are going to call something. And that's probably why I'm, I might be okay with spot fouls. I just don't like the frequency in which they're called because I feel like the refs in, in today's NFL pretty much call any type of contact ever, and it always goes against the defense. What do you think of the first season of being able to review – Pass interference calls. It was pointless. And the reason why it was pointless is because the referees were unwilling to actually overturn any of the calls they made in the first place. Yeah, that did. It, it seemed to me that the later in the season that they finally started to overturn it. But I know at one point it was like only three of 50 had been overturned or something ridiculous like that. The issue that you have, first of all, people made an issue saying, well, it takes too long to review. 
And I disagree with that. I think it might take some time, but I think you have to prioritize whether you want a fluid uh, watching experience or if you want them to get the right call. Considering the fact that people's money are at stake and you have teams that are competing for playoff spots and whatever, I don't care if you add another 15 minutes to a game, especially since everyone's watching in a red zone nowadays anyway with no commercials. The only thing I really care about is do the officials screw a team over or do they actually get the call right? And I'm more concerned about them getting the call right. And so from that perspective, I was fine with the idea, especially after the whole Saints fiasco, which led to a complete overreaction by the NFL. The point that the reason why I had an issue with it was because every time the NFL overturned a call, they basically admitted that the referee sucked. Right. The NFL wasn't going to do that. So there's no point in having a rule in place which is designed as a fail-safe to overturn the refs when you don't have the guts to admit the refs are terrible. So the whole system collapsed on itself, and I think they're going to I think they're going to uh, overturn the uh, and they're getting rid of it. I think it was a one-year wonder, and they decided it was a waste of time. Is it weird? Is it weird to you that the league that generates the most money as the uh, is the only one of the big four that has part-time referees? Uh, I think it's definitely an issue. Uh, for me personally, I think that college football is officiated significantly better than the NFL, with the exception of celebrations. I think college football celebration penalties are the stupidest penalty in sports, and they will call it every time. And I think you should let the kids have fun. Having said that, I love the overtime in college football. I love the pace of play. I think college football is actually more entertaining to watch than the NFL. And that's a controversial opinion by me, but I actually get more enjoyment watching college football than the NFL. Did you like the, what the XFL did as far as their, uh, uh, their, their basically their catch-up time at the end of the game where the, the, the clock would stop on every play until they, uh, they gave them – they would – they would declare the ball ready for play, and then they gave them, I believe, five seconds until the play clock and the, and the, game, and until the game clock rather started running. I think the point of that was to try to prevent teams from just kneeling the ball, which is considered, you know, the most boring play in football. And I'm not really sure what to think of kneeling because I hate the idea of they go into this victory formation and suddenly you're just supposed to surrender after playing for three hours. So I kind of have an issue with the victory formation. But at the end of the day, who cares? The game's over. Just kneel the ball. I mean, there's no point. I mean, you're not, you don't want to flash back to the miracle of the Meadowlands where the Giants are running handoffs and they fumble the ball and you give up a go-ahead touchdown to Herm Edwards with like 30 seconds left, which is completely idiotic. I also can't tell the team, by the way, you're required to run the ball instead of kneeling because then every team would just run a QB sneak and their quarterbacks would get their heads taken off. Right. You know, other than that Joe Pisarchi play that you're talking about, the only other time I remember it actually was a Chiefs game. It was a – I believe it was a Sunday night. It was definitely a night game. I believe it was a Sunday night game against the Chargers. Chargers had the lead, and Phillip Rivers dropped the snap. They had a, they had a bad snap. The Chiefs rec rec uh, recovered the ball somewhere around the 30 and were able to kick a long field goal on the last play of the game to win the game. That's the only other time I can remember anything happening – uh, in victory formation. The uh, truth is that if the MLB really got rid of the intentional walk and they just turned it into an immediate go to first base, we don't want to watch you throw out four pitches. And people were outraged at first and they realized, who cares? Because every time you mess up for an intentional walk, you have probably around a thousand successful intentional walks. I think you could honestly just skip the victory formation if you really wanted to. This team's up seven. You got to kneel the ball. Just wave the flag. It, it, it's really over. I don't need to see the clock drain down for a minute 49. You know what I mean? Right. I mean, I understand you can say, well, it might happen. You know, this might – just stop it. The game's over. It Just go home. Beat traffic. Do something. You know, it, I don't know. Maybe that's just me. It's How old are you? Of, it's, an un, it's definitely an unusual rant. I just – I don't need to see the victory formation where the defense is going to – get criticized for actually trying to sprint through the offensive line and trying to decapitate the quarterback before they are able to kneel the ball, which apparently is a cardinal sin, which makes no sense to me because there's time on the clock. So either A, you're going to embrace the fact that the game is over and the defense shouldn't try, or B, just fast forward the kneeling and who cares. Now, how are you on the uh, 
the unwritten rules of sports. So you kind of brought up one there about Val. Am I wrong? Do you agree with me there? I don't get it. Like the about- offense goes into the sudden formation and they're suddenly untouchable after playing for three and a half hours. Yeah, isn't that wild? And you get uh, and you get a little woofing if, if the defense tries to come at you too strong. Or, or Greg Schiano did that. When he was still a coach at Tampa Bay before he got fired, he was telling his defensive line, I want you to shove the offensive line into the quarterback. Right. We'll see what happens. And they started brawls for the most part. I remember right. He was a – And that. my thought is, what do you want them to do? Right. You're in this sudden untouchable touch football situation – where you're trying to kneel the ball, everyone knows the game's over, and yet as soon as the defense wants to keep trying for a full 60 minutes, which is what you're taught to do, suddenly there are a bunch of renegades who need to be stopped. Yeah, it turns into the Pro Bowl all of a sudden. I don't know what you want. You can't have it both ways. You can't argue for players to compete for all 60 minutes and to never, you know, stop trying and then get angry at them when they're still trying. All right, so what about, like, the unwritten rules, like in baseball? Are you, are you uh, totally against those as well? I think unwritten rules are honestly stupid. I don't understand any unwritten rules besides throwing at a batter who, uh, after the opposing pitcher, just completely drilled your guy. I'm fine with retaliation okay. and the umpires letting you get away with it. Within reason, don't throw it at their forehead to potentially make them blind. Like, you got to draw some lines here. But you got to, you know – get vigilante justice at some point. The issues I have are, oh, you have a perfect game and you're up three runs, but you're not allowed to bunt. Yeah, bunt. Me. Don't I thought bunt. I'm getting paid to get on base here. What are we doing here? What about, uh, what about, what about admiring your work? How about standing at the plate and watching your home run and getting drilled in the ear hole next time up? You okay with that? I think the issue you have there is that the pitcher shouldn't have thrown it for the batter to hit it 450 feet. I mean, the Royals thing was an example last year with Tim Anderson. Now, right. Did Tim Anderson overdo it? Of course. But you shouldn't have let him hit a bomb right off you by throwing a fastball right down the middle. You know, I feel like that's where I stand on it, where you can – because the issue I have is that as soon as a pitcher strikes somebody out with the bases loaded, they're fist pumping and they're going, let's go. You know, I got it. Let's go. And then, you know, nobody can say anything. But as soon as they completely butcher a pitch – and the guy stares at it as it heads to the moon, then suddenly, I don't know, they're just bad people. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't think it makes any sense to me. Are, are we on the same page on that? Um, yeah, although... Within a limit. You can't just stare at it for 30 seconds. But yeah. uh, I'm okay if you bat flip it and whatever. Who cares? You like that? You like the... the, the that was going to be my next question. You already... How many home runs do you actually hit per season? The average player, 20 well, I hit, I don't hit many. That's what I'm saying. Twenty something. Um, oh no, no. Maybe the aver- less. I mean, the average player. Yeah, I mean, like what, how many home runs? You got twenty six guys on your roster. Twenty five guys on your roster. How many home runs does a team? I'm hit? talking about like an everyday player. I'm not talking about the bench warmers who never actually play. Yeah, Fifteen. Yeah. Okay. So mid teens. Yeah. I would if you so. bomb one and you know it's gone, you should probably be able to celebrate. That's all I'm saying. Okay. I mean the issue. Uh, there are some unwritten rules in baseball that I just think are so dumb. I'm fine with the vigilante justice where if somebody throws at my guy, I'm going to throw at their guy because that's fine. And sometimes the umpires don't really do a good job in, you know, legislating that type of behavior. And I think they probably should. But the issue I have is, oh, I just threw a meatball right down the middle, but he's staring at it. This guy's mean. My feelings are hurt. I'm like, are you serious? This guy's getting paid $15 million, and you just threw the worst pitch in the entire game. What are you talking about? I kind of agree. Yeah, if you want, if you want people not to uh, not to do that, you should suck less. Correct. Be I mean, that, that's my – my feelings are hurt. He didn't have he, – I know he hit the home run, but he could have ran it – no! Okay, because if you struck him out with the bases loaded, you would just have a massive fist bump and start screaming like a maniac on the mound. Have it both uh, ways. By the way, everybody, stay off of Scott's lawn. It's going to be no I mean, that's just, I don't know. It's just a matter of, I feel like people in sports get so sensitive about certain things, and I have no idea when it started. I don't know when it became a thing. I don't know. It's just snowflakes. My thoughts on it. Bunch of snowflakes out there. That's what, that's, that's what they are. I mean, I can understand being a snowflake in some aspects because some people get offended by, you know, specifically with terminologies and stuff like that. I mean, is it a little bit excessive now? Maybe, but I understand the premise. But when it comes to sports, 
where everything is based on, you know, being better than the other team, and suddenly the other team's crying that you're better than them. I don't really know what happened there. You know, am I am I alone here, or are we on the same page? We're not. You're not alone. No, I'm 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 kind of with you on that one. Uh, here's one that we argue about. Uh, I, I have a constant argue about. There's kind of a new school of thought. Scott, is, is momentum a thing? I think it is, but I think it definitely is not as big of a thing as it was because you have significantly more commercials and more clock stoppages. Momentum matters, but you need to keep playing. If you have five minute breaks every three minutes for commercials, then I feel like momentum kind of goes by the wayside. You know what I mean? Now, see, and, I, and I've got, and there's a whole school of thought, and I've got a buddy of mine that's a, that's a big sports fan. He's a big analytics guy. And uh, he, doesn't believe, he doesn't believe in momentum. His momentum is, uh, is like clutch hitting. It's, it's not really a thing. I don't, I don't but, really know how you argue with momentum. What, what's I, the argument there? You know what? It, it, well, it, it, you the argue, scoring runs in basketball just aren't momentum-based. I don't really know what that means. I think you argue from a math standpoint that you say that, uh, you know, you have to admit then that uh, one team isn't trying as hard or one team is uh, uh, almost – Curse to miss when they come down and shoot. You know? Okay, well, well, I can – okay, for a counter thing. If you're playing basketball right, would you agree that in most basketball games the home team wins the majority of the time? Oh, sure. So my argument there is let's just say the road team is winning and the home crowd is extremely quiet. And then suddenly the Warriors go on a 13-0 run and they're winning by three points. And the crowd is suddenly all the way into it. You don't think that's going to have a negative impact on the opposing team? I agree. I, I, I think I think even from an uh, I think it has an impact from a, from a, an officiating standpoint. That too. So when can't you argue that maybe momentum might be a product of the interaction between the fans and the refs? I believe that his argument would be that it's not something. It's not momentum. It's just the way that. Uh, that particular run happened to go. No, no, I understand his argument. I'm asking you personally. Oh, no, I'm a big fan. I think I think momentum, I think momentum 100% exists. No, absolutely. I totally agree that momentum is a thing. I've, I've, I've played sports. I've watched sports. Momentum is absolutely a thing. You know, you're, um, if, you've, if you've been competitive in any kind of a sport, you know that sometimes you're in the zone. Mm-hmm. You know that sometimes everything you do is the right thing. And sometimes everything you do is the wrong thing. Correct. And that definitely counts as momentum. Yeah, so. I'm, I'm, yeah I agree. Uh, all right. So here's the next question. How long till we have laser umps? You mean in, robot umps? In Major League. Yeah, robo, robo umps in Major League Baseball. Um, uh, at least for home play, for balls and strikes. We will get robo umps as soon as Rob Manfred decides to actually punish teams that cheat in, uh, in baseball. So not mm-hmm. anytime soon. Mm. that's how i would view it but uh is it too soon to make a comment like that it's been uh what is no no i don't think so i i think that uh eventually at some i don't think there's any real reason like are more people gonna watch the sport because you have robo lumps no no it's all about viewership i feel like that's really all that matters when it comes to making decisions yeah, I, I, I don't I, – I know they tried it in, in some of the minor leagues here the last couple of seasons. I think it's uh, – I heard it wasn't bad. It's gone okay. Did, I did not see any of the games um, that had that had the the, uh, the robo up. No, I haven't, but I heard it was actually pretty successful. I just I just think the MLB is more to worry about. The whole point – the whole, the only job of a real commissioner is to make sure that your league isn't losing money. Yes. So as long as you get people to watch your product, or if you can't, you're going to make more rules to get people to watch your product. And I don't think people are suddenly going to watch more baseball because the ump's a robot. Scott, what do you think, what do you think that the coronavirus is going to do to sports uh, viewership overall? Are there going to be people that realize for the last two months or so that, in however long this ends up being, that – they didn't really need sports in their lives. Cause you know, we talked about, um, you know, our personal stuff that we're doing, you know, we're, we're putting out videos, we're doing content and you know, it's like, it's like people all of a sudden they've turned that switch and they don't, they don't, they don't care. They don't, they don't watch it. Um, and that's, and that goes across the board. I know numbers are down for sporting programs, for podcasts, for, um, you know, various channels on Sirius XM. I know those numbers are down. Well, even TV channels, let alone Sirius XM channels. 
Right. So, I mean, is there a certain percentage of the people that are going to realize, you know, I don't want to get all kumbaya here, but they're going to realize that there were other things that are more important than sports? Uh, for me, no. I think that the people that will, sorry that I just completely dissected your question with one word, but uh, for me, no. I believe that the people. Compelling radio, for sure. I believe the people who realize they don't need sports <laughs> are the people who barely interacted with sports in the first place. I'm talking about the people who watch an occasional game from a team. They might know three players on their favorite team, and they might be in one fantasy league. I think those people maybe okay. might not be fully invested, but so many people have sports ingrained with, within them that they're not going to suddenly turn their back on it. I mean, you can make the argument that even though there are not many sports going on and some people have moved on, it's the highest television-rated draft of all time. Michael Jordan's documentary is the highest-rated documentary of all time based on viewership. People are still craving sports. The issue is that there's no medium to find sports. So as soon as sports comes back, I just expect everybody to go back to the way things were before this thing came. You might, now, the issue you might have is that you have to wonder how long it'll take for these huge sports fans to actually attend the games in person, which is a completely separate topic. But when it comes to actually following sports and being involved in sports, I think everything's going to go back to, to normal, relatively speaking, when it comes to just following it on television and through betting and whatever. I'm sorry, the correct answer, Scott, was 12%. The viewers oh, down 12%. My math got me eight and a half. So I got to re- I got to recheck some numbers there. Uh, well, let's talk, about it from, let's talk about it from a personal standpoint. Wait, do you agree with me on that, though? Uh, no, I think, I think people, I think there will be a, a significant a portion. I think it's going to be over 10% or a little bit over. Uh, I think viewership will be down. I think sports will be Well, viewership, viewership regarding what? Specific channels? Because viewership was down anyway because people just stream stuff online regardless. No. Uh, well, I, I mean, well, not the NFL. I mean, I think the uh, – I think the NFL numbers are going to be down. I think uh, attendance numbers are going to be way down. Wait, so time out. You think that the NFL uh, viewership numbers will be down even yes. though it's the highest rated draft in the history of the NFL? Yes. Yes, I do. I, I personally disagree with you on that. But that's I, think, I think compared – and I'd like to see what the actual numbers are, but, I, you, you know, you talk, we throw around this – you know, and, and, we, and we had Dave Mason yesterday for Bet Online, and he talked about um, – you know, how much, how much more action they took on this year's draft. But I want to know how much action they took or how much viewership you've got compared to a Monday night football game. Um, are you, you have more people watching the draft than when watching a typical Monday night football game. I mean, what are we, what are we talking about here? Um, I, I, don't, I think at the end of the day, there's going to be so many people going back to their fantasy leagues and going back to betting and still rooting for their favorite team. I don't know how you can be a true fan if you root for a team for like 20 something years and then all of a sudden, you just decide, you know what? I don't want to be a fan of the Eagles anymore. Well, what I'm saying is – Eagles still as an example. You know, I don't want to be a fan of Team X. Well, sure, but what I'm saying is maybe you're still a fan of the Eagles, but maybe that game every week is an appointment television. Maybe, maybe you make a plan with the family on a, uh, on a Sunday in the fall, which, you know, would be – verboten for a lot of us you know you're telling knows. me that somebody's wife is going to ask them to do chores and they're not going to use football as an excuse on sunday i think that's a little bit optimistic <laughs> no but maybe they'll take a drive maybe they'll do a day trip you know maybe they'll uh, get out and smell it am i am i am i am i is my hippie getting through here buddy am i am i am it, I, it might be I, I think too many people enjoy the bonding experience of getting a grill getting people together and watching sports. I think that at the end of the day, assuming that health is 100% guaranteed, because that's also a huge question mark. I don't think people are going to suddenly go back to everyday life if there's still a chance the coronavirus is out there. But if there's a vaccine at some point made, and you know with the same certainty you had before the corona even started, that you know, you're going to be healthy going out and there isn't much of a threat, I think everyone's just going to go back to what they're accustomed to. People might have picked up more hobbies in between, but at the end of the day, I think sports will always reign supreme when it comes to entertainment. Very good. Uh, just kind of a side note, when will you go back to a stadium? Uh, it depends how cheap the tickets are. 
Really? Yes. So, so the truth, the, the truth so of the matter is, is that, first of all, it depends on what sport I'm actually going to. Okay. If I had a spot at Fight Island for the UFC, I'm going. I'm moving for like three months, and I'm going to go to every card. That, that's a rumor. If Dana White, for some reason, is watching this, hit me up. Uh, I'll cover it from winter, for winners and winners. No, but I just love sports, and I know that health is the biggest concern, and I know that that will deter people from going outside as it should. But you also have to wonder, if so many people are afraid of catching a virus, then does that inherently mean you're less likely to catch the virus because less people are outside? Okay, well, that's interesting. I might have just blew your mind right there. <laughs> mind blown. I'm just saying, because if you say an argument, let's just say a million people are outside, right? right. And some of them have corona. Sure. And now because everyone's stuck indoors, you have 100,000 people outside instead of a million. Aren't you less likely to get sick because you have less people outside? Your odds have gone down by 90%. Is that what that's you're what saying? I'm saying? Isn't that I, – I, I might be flawed math here, but doesn't that make sense conceptually? Sure. Sure, it does. It does. Um, Maybe I just want a vacation on some random island. That also helps. I could use a tan. So there's a price point for you. So if, if somebody had Jets tickets at the 50-yard line for $1,000, you would not be interested. No. But if, if you somebody had those tickets for 10 bucks, I'm going. 10 bucks, Like 100 bucks? Would you go for $100? Uh, it depends who's playing. That involves me watching the Jets. That's, that's a tough bargain. That's a very tough bargain. You, you, might, you might be able to go and see Ghost. So, uh potentially yeah basically um so let's uh wait what about you you know i've uh i i'm i've pretty much locked myself into the viewing experience and red zone channel here on this on sundays i don't uh i haven't gone to a football game in a long time if I'm no being... i haven't it's it's the the hassle factor for me you're not a fan of the three-hour traffic no i'm not and the price you know you know in kansas city you know tailgating is a big thing so let me ask though, 50 yard line. Somebody gives you a ticket for 10 bucks to see Patrick Mahomes. Are you going? Man, I don't know. I honestly the don't. The fact that you have to think about that kind of proves my point. Yeah, I know. Oh, I had a I had a chance to go for free to see the snow game against Denver this year. I had the under in the first half. Oh, Easy cash. Easy good, cash. Good play. I was in Philadelphia uh, for that actually. I was at Parks Casino. So was that right? I was putting bets in, yeah. That was the same. Yeah, I remember watching that game. That was an early afternoon. How are, the, how are the Pennsylvania casinos? Are they good? Parks is very nice. Uh, I can't say I've been to I can't say that I've been to uh, Sugar House. I've never been there. I've heard good things though. But yeah. Parks, I actually really like their sports book. I think it's very nice. Uh, they also have poker, which I go to the poker room every now and then. But they got nice recliners. They got food. Uh, they got waitresses coming around. Very comfortable. Free. I go there, and they have an app so you can put all your bets in on your phone. You get free drinks uh yes i believe so i yeah. usually just get water but uh did i have to pay for a beer i don't know i I'm, I'm trying to think i might have i know that if you buy drinks i'm pretty sure it's comped if you're in the poker room or if you're in the casino so okay. you can just figure it out there but yeah and i guess and i haven't been to vegas in a while but I, but i guess now they uh you actually have to uh you actually have to uh pay for your drinks most times in the sports books in they the really, sports books, yes, but if you're by the poker tables, you can pretty much get them for free. You still get, you're still giving a, uh, still giving free drinks in the poker room. Uh, yes, I remember when I was I was at the MGM playing poker maybe two years ago, give yeah. or take, and I probably had about I don't know five screwdrivers. Didn't charge me once. What's your uh, what, what's your game when you play poker, Scott? What do you like to play? Uh, I play Texas Hold'em, but I'm either playing one two or one three. I'm sorry I'm not playing 510 or 100, 500. Like, I'm sorry I'm not playing for massive stacks of cash, like Molly's game with millions on the table. But no, I'll buy in for a couple hundred, and I'll see what happens. Usually I'm profitable, but every now and then uh, you get good cards and your opponent runs, has better cards, and you just lose. It happens. You don't play, uh, you, you don't, you don't play uh, like a 5-5 five, five or 5-10 five, Omaha game? Uh, no. Omaha is one of those games that I dabble in. Uh, but overall, um, nah, not really. I do it occasionally, but I'm more profitable in Hold'em, so why would I not just keep playing Hold'em? Yeah, I don't want to, I don't want, I don't want to pay $200 to see a flop. 
it's kind of the way I feel about Pot Lemon Omaha. That, kind of- that's fair. I mean, yeah. that's the point, though. If you're buying one, two, that's also part of the reason why I like playing low uh, limit or no limit below uh, uh, blinds because the last thing you want to do at a table is buy in for, I'd say, the minimum. And then you have one guy with about 10 times your stack trying to put you all in every flop. You're just going to lose. I mean, there's no way around it. You're just going to get bullied into submission. Unless yeah, you pick up a really good hand. Yeah, well, and, it, and that comes down to that comes down to the value of chips. And when you're when you're sitting at a, in, in a game and you're outgunned ten to one, the, you, there's a your odds are terrible. Well, the, the the chips have a different value. Yeah, they're they're not you know, we, and we could go into that as some and maybe someday we will go down the uh, the poker road because um, yeah, I used to you know I don't, I don't know if you know my background. I, I did I ran a poker room here at one of the largest casinos. Uh, west of the Mississippi, as I used to say, nice. um, outside of Vegas. I mean, it was. Uh, I yeah, can't. I, like, I can't say that I actually knew that. Um, yeah, I, I was. A big, I was a big poker guy. I like to play a lot of poker. Well, you um, still do online, so if that counts for anything. You what? You still play online, if that counts. I do play a little bit. Um, I used to, uh, boy, in the in the heyday of online poker, my friend, back in. You, you uh, mean full tilt pre Ponzi scheme? No, I mean I mean uh, party poker and paradise poker pre U I G E A. Yeah. Party poker's still around, but it's all Europe now. Right, right, right. No, I think both of the I think both of them still exist. They uh, might. I, I know party poker's uh I watched some YouTubers who are sponsored by them and they play videos over there. My yeah. goodness, those games were soft. And I, I played a lot of uh, 08 over there. Well it um, depends uh, I mean some games are soft but also depends on what the blinds are playing are. Where the people who are soft are gonna be significantly more frequent in 50 cent dollar than they will in five dollar ten dollar well see that was the great thing about those days my friend uh you had people playing for stakes that they had no business playing for um that thought they knew the game and they didn't and that's the dream oh it was, uh, i'm more of a tournament guy but that's just me personally i, I have that success in cash rooms and i have done that from for bet online for years even five dimes it has one of the most prehistoric poker room setups i've ever seen but I used to play micro stakes in college, like five cent, ten cent. Right. And I made like a hundred something bucks in like, I don't know, I'd say two weeks sure. or so. But I mean, of course, it's a, most of the time it's a monumental waste of time because you're playing for three hours and you make three dollars. Right. It's not worth it. I mean, you got to play, I'd say minimum either 25, 50 or 50 cent dollar if you actually want to make some decent amount of money. Agreed. But it was most of it because I was relatively new to online poker. And a part of me still had the conspiracy theory that it was rigged. So I didn't want to throw in all my money on stakes and stuff like that. But bet online, I'll tell you, let me ask you one question though. Do you, some people have conspiracy theories that online poker is rigged. Yes. Are you one of these people or do you think that there's, it's just pure chance? Man, I'll tell you what. I have no idea. I have been, I have seen a lot more strange things. Online. Than I did. Like I said, it, being in my being in my position with a poker background, with a live poker background, I literally saw tens of thousands of hands. Okay, mm. and I see far more weird things happen online than I ever did live. The now, amount of times I lose to three outers on the river agreed. is probably, I'd say, ninety percent higher online than it is in person. Now, the, the the question then becomes: Is it just because you're seeing so many more hands? I don't think it is. Because everything's percentage based, so the yeah, amount I, of hands shouldn't really matter if you're favored to win roughly ninety seven percent of the time. Now, some of that has to do with the fact that most gamblers remember the losses more than the wins, and that's just something that comes with the territory. I understand. But there's been so many tournaments where I'm either on the bubble or I'm on the verge of being a chip leader, and I get absolutely destroyed on some random three outer on the river. Yep, all the time. I would agree with that, but having said that, it doesn't inhibit either one of us from still playing. Uh, well, honestly, those that's what separates you from winning a tournament from placing in a tournament. But to get to that tournament, to get to the placings, there are so many people, as you said before, who are above their pay grade and where they actually are. There's a skill gap there in tournaments where you can just know, all right, I'm entering a tournament with 200-something people. And – well, the tournaments I enter usually have around like 500 to even close to 1,000. But right. you know going in, I'm probably in the top 10 percentile. Right. I mean, of course, some of it's out of your control. 
you pick up pocket king, somebody has pocket aces. You have pocket jack, somebody has ace king, and they hit an ace. I mean, some of it's out of your control, but you can limit the risk and increase the probability of you making a deep run just because you know I can play this post-flop hand better than you can. Right. So there are some ways to limit it, but at the end of the day, you might just, just get you might just lose on a tournament because you're all in 80 something percent post flop and then they hit a they hit a flush draw and you lose and that happens but i don't know i've still been profitable online so i can't really complain about yeah, it yeah agreed and i play I, you know, there's not many online games anymore but i i like to play limit uh, if i'm going to play if i'm going to play a ring game and my my reasoning there is i'm going to put my ability to make the right decision every time against your ability to do that and and playing a limit game uh that's going to even itself out so um and with a with a no limit game where you can certainly have an unskilled player that makes a bad decision about getting his getting his money in with a flush draw yeah when it's not not profitable to do so in other words you can make a you can you can make a bet on the flop that that makes it unprofitable for them to call you and they still do it and they'll hit it. Jam but, all in, they'll call you with a gut shot, even though they have like a five percent like a seven percent chance of hitting it, and then they'll hit the gut shot and you're just like, I lost, but mathematically speaking, you make that play ten times out of ten. Yeah. I agree. That's usually how my poker tournaments go. Occasionally I'll lose where I'll have two pair and somebody will flop a set and it's just unfortunate. There's not much you can do about that situation. But I'd say about eighty percent of the time when I lose in a tournament. I go all in and I am at least a 65% favor, usually. That's fair. And I end up losing. But it is what it is. Mathematically speaking, you got to make the play. Fair enough. So, uh, let's change. I'm going to change gears slightly, Scott. Uh, four months ago, Donald Trump was minus 350. Today, as it sits, he's minus 120. Is that a good play? He's winning. Think so? I mean, whether or not you like Trump or you don't, Biden is a next level candidate when it comes to people having to actually vote for Biden if you don't like Trump. And that is awful. Now, I know that people in the first election were thinking, oh, you know, Hillary's bad, but she's not as bad as Trump, so I'm going to vote for Hillary, and Hillary lost anyway. You think Biden's a real upgrade? Um, you know, I, I don't know. Half the time Biden's on TV, I got no idea what he's talking about. It's going to come down to – how much anti-Trump sentiment is, is out there? That's the problem that you learned with the first election, though. Right. Is that a lot of people who are pro-Trump don't admit that they're pro-Trump. So you got a lot of secret voters behind the scenes who you don't really know exist. That's the theory. And it's going to be, a, it's going to be interesting to see. And, and I do want to do a show. And the last thing I want to do is turn it into a, a political forum. Um, there's, there's plenty of, of outlets for that. Um, I have no desire to get into a political discussion with anybody about the pros or cons of a certain candidate, yeah. but I do want to do a show from a, uh, from a betting standpoint as it, as it gets a little closer here. The truth you- is that I'm not fully familiar with politics as well as other people. I don't, I, I, I don't want to be sound completely informed, but I mostly avoid it just based on the fact that I feel like, A, I don't really know which news is accurate or not. Like, for example, you have the Kim Jong-un potentially being dead for the right. last – week and i don't know if he's alive or dead because i've heard about seven different conflicting reports and i don't know what's accurate or not well of course that's that's a different thing because you've got the hermit kingdom there in north carolina uh, north carolina yeah <laughs> in in north korea yeah Korea, and they definitely clamp down on what news gets out no, no no but i'm just saying just i know i agree but what i'm saying is that any given event can be interpreted in numerous ways that i don't necessarily know which way is an accurate depiction. Yeah. That, and that's, that's really, an issue. And B, I mean, most of politics is always some news reporting mixed with about 80% spin, depending on what side the writer re- supports. You know what I'm proud of, Scott? I'm proud that I've not seen one coronavirus bet anywhere. I think Five Dimes is actually offering coronavirus props. Are they, as far as now, are they doing like death totals or? No, I think it was just based on uh, sports coming back or over under cases or stuff like that. Okay. See, I, and I thought. There's any mortality rates. I believe that's just, that's just cruel. I don't think that's. Well, you know, the betting industry hasn't always been known as having the most uh, sympathetic ears. Really? You mean like the celebrities on who's going to die first and like you can bet the props there? Right, right. That's what I'm saying. That's ridiculous. I don't know how that's a thing. Well, I'm just just saying I'm proud of our industry 
for resisting the urge to put up totals. How is Charlie Sheen only minus 150 to die before Magic Johnson? I don't know. I have no idea. I don't know why you'd even bet any of these, but I do remember that that was one of the props that were set up. You had yeah. like Betty White versus somebody, and I'm like, are you really going to root for somebody to die? What is going on here? That's, uh, yeah, and it is, I, I'm, I, I just, as I say, I'm just, I'm, I'm proud of, of, of the fact um, that. Oh, I'm that market definitely exists. I'll, t- I'll tell you that much. I don't really know who's betting on those props, or I don't really want to know who's betting on those props, but, you know, never underestimate the, uh, the desire for, pe- for people's greed. That's how I'll yeah. put it. So you're saying if, if there was a value bet that someone put up on the coronavirus mortality rate and you thought there was value there, you would not play that? Uh, the truth is I'm probably not informed enough about the actual thing itself. Okay. But at the end of the day, if it was free money, I'm probably going to bet it. Because whether or not I bet it or not, it's not going to change the actual outcome of what's going on. The issue I have, I have is when you are outright rooting for people to just die. I'd have a lot. I'd have a, I'd have a much time, a harder time betting the over. Yes. Uh, I'd have a much harder time betting the over. I'd bet on a misclick where it's just like, oh, over under fifty thousand, as opposed to over under a hundred. Like one of them's guaranteed to happen, whether or not you want it to or not. The other one is a high number, and you start looking at news reports, rooting for bad news. Right. Like right. That's, and- not, that's no way to live. And it's kind of, and, and you could kind of extrapolate that out to the political market, which is what made me, made me think of this. Because at this point, if you're, if you're betting against Trump, you're basically rooting for either death or failure in America. Basically. Um, and, I, and, I know, and I know there's a lot of money out there that's, that's on the other side, and they're, they're going to say, no, that's not true. I, just well, think- I also want to preface this saying... This, this is independent on whether or not you are pro-Trump or if you're Republican or Democrat. We're just talking about in general. Okay. Just, just to be clear. We're not, we're not trying to bash anybody. Any Absolutely. Candidates. Absolutely not. Not a political just, show. Just to be clear. We're talking about this hypothetical situation where the odds of a candidate would definitely go up if bad stuff happened to the country while Trump was president. That's just a fact. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Anyway, you can carry on with your point. No, that's, that's, that's exactly right. That's kind of, that was kind of the direction that I was headed there. Um, and you're, it's, a, it's, it kind of makes me wary about betting on politics. I don't want to, I'm rooting for America. I, I would take, um, if, if we get through this and we have sports in the fall, uh, you pick the worst person in the world. I would take them as president for the next four years. If, um, if, if we can get out of this. So I'm, I'm not going to uh, never root against uh, the success of, of the United States for anything. That's- now, from a betting perspective, the truth is, even though I don't follow politics at all, and I try to avoid it at all costs, I actually predicted pretty much the election, I'd say about two years ago. I said, right. that, uh, I said that Trump would end up going up against Biden, just based on what I thought was going to happen. And that turned out to be exactly the case, even though I actually paid no attention to the, uh, to the debates or anything like that. I didn't watch any of the debates. I just knew going in, uh, Democrats are probably going to screw over Bernie again, and they're going to pick Obama's former vice president because they think he'll have the best tra- chance to beat Trump. That's Good exactly name. what happened. I mean, Good name recognition, absolutely. I mean, it's just the way it is. Now, the question you have to ask yourself if you're betting Trump is, are you afraid of Biden stealing potential Trump voters away? And I'm not. I don't think anybody, including the Democrats, actually like Biden. There are some that definitely do. And there are some people who liked what he did as vice president for Obama to get into brief political topics. But do you think Trump fans are really shaking that they have to go up against Biden? Probably not. No, I don't. You know, the, uh, I, I did well in the last election. I had, I had a great middle position. Um, and I was able to get, I, 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 um, basically loaded up on Trump the day after the, uh, the access Hollywood tape his his mm-hmm. odds uh, dropped. I got him at uh, well it was a it was a hundred it was a hundred point you know must market it was a, mm-hmm. a market type bet, and I got I got Trump at like right at twenty cents, and I I, I couldn't I couldn't pass that up. Yeah, I mean the truth is that if you were going to bet Biden, you probably missed your chance. You probably should have taken it while Bernie was still technically in the race because you would have gotten a better price. Oh yeah. Now yeah. that it's just the two of them. 
I really just don't see much value on Biden, in my opinion. Yeah, uh, Biden right now is plus one twenty five against Trump, and that's uh, possible. I think if you wait it out, it might get to plus two hundred at some points. It's weird because Trump is a minus one twenty and uh, against the field, and he is minus one forty five against Biden. Well, there were some rumors that maybe Cuomo or somebody would come out of the weeds, even though Cuomo said repeatedly, I don't want to run for president. Now, see, you're a, uh, and you're a youngster. You never saw a brokered convention. It is, it is quite a thing to see when, uh, you know, you, you've just seen the primaries where you, you, there's no, uh, the conventions are just, you know, basically a three-day, uh, you know, uh, rah-rah fest. Yeah. But well, back, I'm not, yeah, I'm not I was a boy. Yeah, I'm not going to try to dive into all that stuff because I'm not exactly experienced with that, so I have no real clout when it comes to talking well, about that. As it, as it gets closer, we're going we're gonna, yeah. to... But gonna my question for that. you is, in general, do you actually think the Democrats fully support Biden? I don't know. what I don't, who, do, do you, who do you mean by Democrats? What is, the, what is the, the DNC, the voters? No, voters, just voters. Um, yes, I think there's that. I think there's a bit of a divide there. I think there's, I think, uh, I think that there is enough anti-Trump sentiment among Democrats that there's enough blue, no matter who, that yes, they do support. So you think that people that fully supported Bernie are going to vote for Biden? No, that's the question. I'm a little bit skeptical on that. I think that Bernie got thrown under the bus. And especially since people my age group particularly love Bernie. Uh, at least that's what I've noticed on college campuses. A lot of people like Bernie from, from 20 to it's a college student age. The problem, I don't think they're suddenly going to vote for Biden just because Bernie's out. I, I, don't, I don't see that being as common as people think it's going to be. The problem, Scott, is they didn't vote. They didn't come out. They didn't turn out for the primaries. Um, Bernie could have absolutely uh, had the victory this year. And well, what I'm saying is that since he has not, if they didn't come out to vote for the primaries, do you think they're going to come out for the actual election? I'm a little bit skeptical on that. No, your generation is not going to vote for Biden. That's what I'm saying. No, so based on that, I mean, if Bernie was in... Okay, what I'm trying to say is, even though people might not like Bernie's political beliefs, I personally think Bernie had a better chance of winning an election over Trump than Biden does. There's certainly an argument to be made there. That's my argument. Whether or not you like Bernie or not, I just think he would have attracted a younger voting fan base than Biden. Yeah, well, they, he would have. The question is, would they have turned out? And historically, they don't. So, all right, I didn't, and I and I knew I was kind of opening up a can of worms. I didn't want to go too far down this rabbit hole. I just wanted. To I know. mean, I was. We were talking solely from a betting perspective, and my thoughts. And my yeah. thoughts are honestly, if Trump goes up against Biden, I could be wrong. I think Trump should be the favorite in that matchup. That's all. So I'm your saying. official your your official position would be load up on Trump at uh, at minus one twenty. I wouldn't say load up because honestly, any type of news can break and you have scandals and anything that could happen with any politician. You could see odds fall, you know, completely fall off. But at the end of the day, based on the current number, I think that's a pretty favorable number for Trump betters. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. All right, good. I'm I mean, assuming we're on the same page there. I think there's, I think there's, a, I think there's a good amount of value at Trump at minus one. I think there's a good chance that as you have the actual uh, presidential debates and stuff like that, Trump could climb to maybe minus 200 plus. And I think if you're going to take Biden, you should probably wait it out. Oh, no question. I think, I think if, the second, if the second wave fails to materialize as far as the coronavirus goes, yeah. I, I think by, uh, what are we here, at the end of April, I think by June 1st, Trump will be uh, in the minus 200 range again. Probably. I mean, that would be my assumption. So once again, if you, if you support uh, Biden or if you're a Democrat, we're not roasting you. We're just saying, based on a betting perspective, we think that there would be more value at this point in time betting on Trump to win re-election, right. and whether you, or not you actually want Trump to win or not. Well, and if you are a Democrat, go ahead and play, make that Trump bet, and that way it's a, it's a win-win for you. You know, it's a lot like betting against, your, betting against your favorite team. You know, if your team wins and you lose your bet, you're like, okay, well, my, my team still won. And it's like betting on Trump. If you, if you, if you, like, if you like Biden, if you hate Trump, Make a bet on Trump, because that way, if he wins the presidency, at least you've still made money. Yeah. So based from a betting perspective, I think we can agree that this number is a little bit short on Trump. Yeah. Yeah. A little, little, uh, little bit of an overlay on, uh, on uh, DJT. So mm-hmm. that's, all, that's all I'm saying. All right. Well, bud, we've, uh, we've, got, we've, we've managed to do it. I think you and I 
Um, they got more political than I thought it was going to get. Yeah, I kind of, I kind of took us down a road there. And it's just a, a preview. We will be doing, we'll be doing some betting shows on 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 the, on the election coming up. Just from a betting, from a, from a, always, just from a betting standpoint. Um, I again, this has never been the forum for personal opinions, and it's it's not going to change. I always keep my videos that way in the comments section and stuff like that. Yeah. So. Once again, um, we weren't talking about uh, political. We weren't talking about our own political beliefs or anything like no, that. Just so no, like not, at all. not at all. Not at all. Um, I'm I'm uh, I'm rooting for America, my friend, and and it's. Uh, I think it's, we all are. I think we all are indeed. So, what's going to be the next sports come, Scott? And then we'll, we'll get out of here. What's what's what, what are we going to see? What's on the horizon? For me, if I had to give my personal opinion, I'm picking college football. Okay. Uh, and the reason why is because I feel like if college football actually does not run, I think the NCAA is basically going to implode. Yes. I, and I, I, I think that they pretty much have to have uh, college football if they yeah. want any type of college sports in the immediate future. Yeah. And, it, yeah, it funds, you know, a lot of those programs, 90%. Yeah of their revenue is going to come from college football. So that's, that's a good one. It'll be interesting to see how that plays out. We're going well, to one other idea that I actually wanted to run just by some of the viewers and by you, since uh, I'd say sports aren't exactly as frequent as they used to be, I'm open to the idea of potentially doing a mailbag episode of just getting questions from the audience and we can just answer some stuff. Love it. Love uh, it. If you have any questions below, hit us up and yes. we'll talk about whatever you want. Yes. Put it in the comment section. Uh, we'd like, we always like to know what's on your mind and we would love to have discussions, um, on what, on what America quote unquote is thinking. Right now. We're kind of, I think everybody's kind of isolated. You don't really, uh, you're not, you're not out there interacting with people. You don't always know everybody's opinion. What, what, what everybody thinks. Is everybody more optimistic than us? Are they more pessimistic? Nobody um, knows. So, yeah. Nobody knows. So there you go. All right, bud. So we'll be back on Monday. And the way it stands right now, we're going to do a recap, winners and losers in the draft, things like that. At some point, we will have JT Gray on and talk to him about his experience. He's a, uh, turned into a fine player at Mississippi, Mississippi State Safety. He was second team all pro on the special teams for the New Orleans Saints. And talk about him. He was involved in two very, very heartbreaking games there in the playoffs. I'd like to get his thoughts there uh, about what, the, what that locker room was like after those two, after those two uh, defeats there to Minnesota and to the Rams. So. Yeah, definitely should be a lot of fun. Hopefully that ends up uh, materializing as soon as possible. But uh, we'll, keep you, we'll look, keep you in the know, so to yes, speak. Absolutely. All right, man. Well, have a, have a good rest of your weekend. As always, thank you to everybody out there for joining us, for checking us out. And we appreciate the, uh, we pre we appreciate the views. We appreciate you hanging with us today as Scott and I just kind of winged it. And uh, as always, for myself, for Scott Reichel, we are uh, – with winners and winers telling you to check out the content. Um, we are always putting up fresh content over at winners and winers. Even in these times we have pivoted nicely. We've got uh, winning Willie kind of crushing it on esports over there. And I know we're uh, going to start putting up some, some content on some different things. So make sure you check that out. Uh, the dominator, he's a big fan of the WWE. So uh, yeah, good, good times. Plenty of stuff to choose from. It's not like it was, but there is plenty of stuff to still get a little action going if you so choose to so check out winnersandwiners.com. And you guys, everybody out there, stay healthy, stay safe, stay home. You know what? We're going to get through it. We're going to have sports back before you know it. And until then, we'll be here to entertain and delight you. For myself, for Scott Reichel, for all of us over here at winnersandwiners.com, you guys have a great weekend. Hope all of your bets are winning bets. And, uh, Enjoy it. We'll uh, see you next time. Take care.